Welcome to the virtual lecture for Discrete Math 2, planned for January 8th. Uh, this is part one, in which we are going to address the basics of counting, including the sum rule, product rule, subtraction rule, and division rule. This whole chapter is about combinatorics, which is the study of counting. And I hope you've read the textbook, uh, section 6.1. And the very first line of this chapter, your author says that combinatorics is the search to understand patterns. It's not always clear what that means. Um, so I wanted to talk about that before we get into the details of the, the rules. Really, uh, the first step is to determine whether a pattern exists. And then, and only then, if possible, we want to count how many of those patterns there are. I wanted to come up with an example I thought a lot of you would relate to. And I know in one of your classes, you have to program a Tetris board. So a particular pattern that we could ask about is whether you can take a standard Tetris board, so that's a 10 by 20 grid, and tile it perfectly with game pieces. Um, don't assume that you're playing the game and, and lines disappear when they're filled in, but can you actually take the different shapes, game pieces, and tile the entire 10 by 20 board? I hope you believe the answer is yes, and to understand existence in this case, all you have to do is exhibit one such tiling. And I know you can do such a tiling with the long, skinny, one by five shape, uh, and you will be able to fill the entire board up if you had an unlimited number of that shape. So the existence question here is pretty easy. Now I'm going to ask how many different perfect tilings of a Tetris board are there with game pieces? That question ends up being pretty hard. It was answered recently by Stephen Butler and some of his students at Iowa State University, and it ends up being over 291 decillion. That's a big number. Uh, and he used beautiful techniques of combinatorics to determine that. So in this case, we have an example of an existence question being easy and the counting question being hard but being solvable. Sometimes the existence question is hard. And things like, are there an infinitude of twin primes, which is one of those big millennial problems. Sometimes the counting question is hard. So why do we count in the first place? For you, as a computer scientist, really you want to understand how long an algorithm is going to take. Nanoseconds versus millennium. You can write a perfectly good program that will answer the question you have been tasked to answer, but it will not com be complete in your lifetime. You probably haven't done an appropriate job. So. In your case, understanding the complexity of an algorithm is critical. For me, it's really a question of promoting critical thinking and mathematics. Um, people tell me all the time when I, that they hate mathematics. It's their worst subject in school. And no one would ever say that about their ability to read. So in fact, no one has ever said it about their ability to count. Pretty much everyone can count. And I think if people understand that counting is mathematics, maybe they won't be as scared of mathematics in the future. OK, end of sermon. Let's learn. Let's start with section 6.1, the basics of counting. Last time, I left you with two algorithms uh, to figure out what the output would be. And as I'm sitting here recording, I realize I need to change uh, a variable name because I'm using k in two different ways. So let me change one of the loop indexes uh, from being called k to being called z. And now I think we're ready to tackle these problems. In the first bit of pseudocode, we have four nested loops. 
So to determine the output, you're going to think from the inside out. The internal loop, the internal most loop here, uh, as it gets executed three times, is going to increment our counter uh, one each time. So it will increment the counter by three. Then as we consider each one of the, you know, the bounding loops, if that's what we want to call them, um, they will again run the loops inside. So we end up with 3 times 4 times 10 times 5 as being the number of times we've incremented k by 1. So our counter, which started at 0, will end up at 600. For the second uh, little bit of pseudocode, the loops now are sequential. Uh, we have to think linearly, and they don't really affect each other except um, that they change the value of k as they get executed. So this time, uh, when we execute uh, the loop indexed by the variable i, we're going to increment our counter by 5. And then the second loop, uh, incremented by the variable j, um, it's going to change the value of our counter by 10. Uh, but this time, we end up adding the increments rather than multiplying, uh, which gives us a, a total output of 22. So why did I call these motivation? Well, in the first case, sort of there are four tasks that are happening or that are affecting each other. And the way they combine is through multiplication. That's going to give us the product rule. For the second bit of pseudocode, uh, our tasks here are really independent of one another. And so we add their results. And that's sort of going to be our illustration for the sum rule. So let's walk through the product rule. Suppose that a procedure can be broken down into a sequence of two tasks. If there are n1 ways to do the first task and n2 ways to do the second task, then they're going to be the product of n1 times n2 ways to do the procedure or to do the two tasks together. So this is very much those nested loops where the tasks are executing each of the loops themselves. This can, of course, uh, be applied to any number of tasks. Uh, you can have 10 tasks and then multiply the number of ways to do each one of those tasks together. So that's the product rule. The sum rule, on the other hand, we have a task that can be done in one of n1 or n2 ways. And there's a caveat here where none of the n1 ways is the same as the n2 ways. So in this case, the total number of ways of completing the task are going to be the sum n1 plus n2. And it's important to understand that the ways of the n1 ways of doing uh, the task are disjoint from the n2 ways of doing the task. That's what allows us to add them together. Uh, at this point, you might want to pause the video and take a break uh, and watch a YouTube. Uh, there's a very silly, very 80s video uh, from Square One TV, which was educational TV back in the day, called Combo Jumbo, and it's just to make you laugh. Not required. A binary string is created from an alphabet that contains only 0 and 1. How many 16-bit strings are there? Well, let's write down what our tasks are. Task 1 is going to be to select what the first bit is. Is it 0 or is it 1? The number of options for task 1 is going to be 2. Task 2 is going to be to select the second bit. Again, there will be two options. Task 3, select the third. And task 16 is going to be to select the 16th bit. In each case, we have two options. 
And so the total number of ways, the total number of 16-bit strings is going to be the product of all these twos. There are 16 of them, so it ends up being 2 to the 16th. So that is a very straightforward application of the product rule. Now, how many ways can you have a 16-bit string that ends with the sequence 1 or 1, 0? What's important here is these two possibilities, ending in 1 versus ending in 1, 0, are disjoint. You can't end in 1, 0 and also end in 1. So we want to count how many strings end in 1 and then how many strings end in 1, 0 and add those together to get the total number of bit strings asked for. In terms of ending in 1, it's very similar to what we did in, in part 1, except now for the 16th bit that is already specified. So when you do your multiplication, you will be multiplying 2 by itself only 15 times. So there will be 2 to the 15th strings ending in a 1, and there will be, for similar reasons, 2 to the 14th strings ending in 1, 0, which means our answer is going to be 2 to the 15th plus 2 to the 14th. Variations on a theme, 16-bit strings that end with 1, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0. These, again, are disjoint events, so we simply need to add up how many end with a 1, how many end with a 1, 0, and how many end with a 1, 0, 0. That's going to be the sum of 2 to the 15th 2 to the 14th, and 2 to the 13th. And last is our an example. How many 16-bit strings end with 1 or 1-1? One, one? This time, I hope you realize that ending in 1-1 one, one is not a, a disjoint event as strings ending in 1. In fact, they entirely overlap. Uh, if we were to draw the Venn diagram, the strings ending in 1-1 one, one belong entirely within the set of strings that end with 1. So really, here, all you have to do is count the strings that end with 1. We've already done that. They're going to be 2 to the 15th. Now, whenever you have addition, there's always a subtraction version that goes along with it. So there is a subtraction rule. I've written down what the addition rule is here. Okay, that's exactly what the addition rule says. The subtraction rule allows us to remove the requirement that the ways of completing the task are distinct. But when we remove that requirement, we have to remove the double counting that took place. So the total number of ways that a task can be done in n1 or n2 ways is going to be n1 plus n2 minus the number of ways common to both sets. Okay. So um, this is also known as inclusion-exclusion on two sets. It can be generalized to as many sets as you want. Um, and you may have seen it back in your chapter on set theory when you were looking at the size of the union of two sets. Because when you look at the size of the union of two sets, you take the size of the first set, you add it to the size of the second set, and then you have to subtract off the size of the intersection. So let's do a, a brief visitation uh, back on problem four and realize that we could have approached it a different way. I can embrace the fact that they overlap and use the subtraction rule. So it's going to be the number of strings that end in 1 plus the number of strings that end in 1, 1 and subtract the number of strings that end in both 1 and 1, 1. But of course, there are 2 to the 15th strings that end in 1. There are 2 to the 14th strings that end in 1, 1. And any string that ends in 1, 1 also ends in 1, so there are 2 to the 14th strings that end in both, which means uh, these two 2 to the 14th cancel, and again, we end up with 2 to the 15th as our answer. So this is sort of a lesson that 
there will be many, many ways to get to the same answer. Sometimes if you can find two different ways to get to the same answer, you can feel a little bit more self-assured that the answer you have obtained is correct. One last rule, the division rule, because the partner to multiplication is division, so if we have a multiplication rule, we always ask, is there a division rule? Um, and what this says, that if you have a task that can be done in n ways, but um, for every one of those ways, exactly d of them corresponds to the same way, then that task can be completed in n over d ways. I think that sounds a little confusing, and I like to call the division rule cow counting. Uh, so what do I mean by cow counting? Well, suppose you are an ant in a field and you want to count the number of cows in that field. Because your perspective is so low, you can't see the massive body above you, but only the hoofs. So instead of counting heads of the cows, you're going to count the legs. And in this case, our cow, as most cows do, have four legs. So the total number of cows in the field is going to end up being uh, the total number of legs that you've counted, but for each cow, four of those legs belong to one cow, so it's going to be the number of legs divided by four is the number of cows. And really, that's what the division rule is saying. Cow counting. So now it's your turn to give this a try. I've given you three problems. I'd like you to read them. I'd like you to try them on your own. And I'd like you to calculate an answer. And if your answers agree with the answers I've given you here, you don't need to watch part two. Part two will simply work through the answers of these three problems, but you may want to skip to part three.